go ahead and start. Um, so we have a special CGD seminar today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Chena Sadi. Sadai, I'm so sorry. Totally fine. Um, who is the HITS Fellow for Litigation Relevant Science at the Union of Concerned Scientists? Um, and she will be presenting on investigating Antarctic ice sheet climate feedbacks and climate justice implications. Um, so, Shana earned her PhD at UMass Amherst in the Department of Earth, Geographic, and Climate Sciences. She also holds an MS in Applied Mathematics and a Bachelor's in Astronomy and Astrophysics as well as a bachelor's in physics from UMass Amherst. Um, her research broadly focuses on interests including sea level rise, ice sheet dynamics, future climate projections, and climate justice. But the research being done in her current two-year fellowship um, is specifically focused on exploring climate attribution of sea level rise and global methane emissions. Um, and so, reminder, if you are online with us, um, we will take questions at the end. Um, and so in the meantime, if a question pops up and you want to jot it down, you can do so in the chat, um, but we won't actually address those until uh, she knows of her presentation. All right, off to you. Okay, thank you so much. I am really excited to be here. I, I did my PhD work um, remotely using CESM and accessing computing resources here, but this is my first time ever being here in the seven years of like working very related to this facility. Um, and yeah, so it's really lovely to be here joining you all. Um, okay, so just a little bit about me in addition to that excellent introduction. Um, I just will pop up. Okay, I got um, yeah, so I just finished up my dissertation. I defended last summer and I started my postdoc at the Union of Concerned Scientists in September. Um, alongside my PhD work, I did like a joint PhD that was a combination of climate sciences and critical physical geography. Um, and I'll get into more of, oh, I don't know why it's advanced. I got it set. Let me do that. I'm not doing that. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I also did like a lot of uh, teaching work. This is my geography climate justice students from last year. Um, I've done policy work at the local, the national and the international level. I also have 20 years background in um, environmental and human rights organizing. And I volunteer at Western Massachusetts Rabbit Rescue. These are two rabbits. I personally rescued both of them and adopted both of them rapidly spiraling. Um, <laughs> I also really like uh, canoeing and just like taking pictures outdoors and just being outside in general. Um, it's beautiful. Um, so that's a little bit of my background. And the in, within my postdoc, I work specifically within the Union of Concerned Scientists at the Science Hub for Climate Litigation, um, focusing on that sort of area. Okay, so the research that I do begins in Antarctica, a place that I've never been and honestly don't really want to go to, but a place that is so central to our, our Earth system. And so um, the Antarctic ice sheet, of course, like we tend to think about it in the two different halves of the West Antarctic ice sheet, which holds maybe about five meters of sea level rise equivalent, and then the East Antarctic ice sheet, which holds um, a lot more sea level rise potential, but particularly because um, the ice sheet is marine based, meaning that it lays on bedrock that is in many areas below sea level. It's particularly vulnerable, especially as the oceans start to warm um, and, and uh, ice shelves that fringe the continent begin to melt away, then we're seeing an increasing sea level contribution over time. And observational evidence shows that there's increasing mass loss, particularly in the Amundsen Sea regions. Sorry about that. Um, and so when we're thinking about Antarctica, we're often thinking about the sea level rise contribution. And the Antarctic ice sheet has the potential, because it has so much sea level rise potential tucked up within it, it has the potential to be the dominant driver of sea level rise in the long term. And so trying to constrain like how much sea level rise could happen at what point in time, like how quickly could that occur, is one of the um, areas of research that's ongoing with ice sheet modeling. Why does it? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but the in terms of sea level rise generally, 
it is accelerating over time and it's unevenly distributed. So this is some satellite altimetry data. Um, it shows sort of like the spatial variations of where sea level rise is occurring over the, um, the last couple of decades. And then this is some projections from the IPCC AR6 report of sea level rise into the future. And so near-term emissions will dictate the long-term response and sea levels will continue to rise even under a very low emission scenario for a couple hundred years into the future at least, and will stay elevated for thousands of years following that. And so it's a particularly difficult problem. Um, and these are just like two trajectories under a high emissions or a lower emissions sort of scenario. And so it's this long-term irreversible impact that will affect island and coastal communities around the world for literally thousands of years to come. But Antarctica is not just impacting sea level rise, it's also impacting other aspects of the climate system through interactions with the atmosphere and the oceans um, and the solid earth underneath. And so the climate models in the CMIP 5 and CMIP 6 era don't have fully dynamic ice sheets, though hopefully soon this will change things in part two. There's some of the really excellent work being done here um, in relation to coupled modeling. And thank you. <laughs> Um, so because climate models don't have fully dynamic ice sheets, they tend to underestimate the, in the projections that we currently use, it's underestimating the effects of meltwater feedbacks um, that the ice sheet mass loss is going to have on the climate. And so to correct for this, freshwater forcing experiments are done and work by many different teams shows pretty consistent responses with Antarctic freshwater forcing experiments. And those are um, an expansion of sea ice in the Southern Ocean, delayed atmospheric temperature rise, and an increase in subsurface ocean temperatures. This is just a schematic representation, um, this fillhouse projection of how Antarctica is central to the climate system through some of these, like, this is showing particularly ocean pathways and how the southern ocean sort of connects all the other ocean basins. Um, and so I started out my PhD work doing these type of freshwater forcing experiments. And the tools that I was using for that are the community earth system model, and the Penn State University ice sheet model. And so CESM, you're all familiar with, is able to simulate um, the atmosphere, the ocean, sea ice, land. And I tend to run it at a one degree resolution, um, but because it doesn't have a fully dynamic Antarctic ice sheet, I am bringing in the Penn State University ice sheet model, um, which two of my dissertation advisors, Rob DeConto and Dave Pollard, um, created. And this, um, this ice sheet model is able to simulate that basal melt, that melting um, below the floating ice shelves and um, calving surface melt. And it's able to give us projections that include both marine ice sheet instability and marine ice cliff instability. And this is run at about a 10 kilometer resolution. And so I am um, running these two models and how I actually do my day-to-day -day work is I do field work. Um, but I do my climate modeling field work where I just literally bring my laptop outside and tunnel into the supercomputer, the Cheyenne supercomputer, and I sit in my gardens with um, wild bunnies and monarch butterflies. Baby bunny, amazing. So I love that I have job that lets me work remotely. And I would prefer to do this type of Antarctic work than Antarctic field work because I like the flowers. Um, <laughs> so that's sort of my day-to-day, -day, like how I actually do the job. Um, and so for that first chapter of my dissertation, which was published in Science Advances back in 2020, I was using the output from ice sheet modeling and just feeding that into CESM as a freshwater forcing, and then um, going forward over time in that sort of what that was red thing. Yeah, is that? What is that going on? Somebody else find doing that? No, nobody else should have access to your screen. Oh, you guys. Is this, <laughs> is this a presentation that you like recorded as a, or is it just a PowerPoint? Just a PowerPoint. I don't know. It's going crazy though. Yeah. Cause it's playing like it's a recorded, um, it's playing as though it's, it's like a recorded PowerPoint. Um, but it's weird, which it is not recorded. Okay. Let me see if I can, anyone have suggestions? Google, let me see if I can Google and if I can come up with some solution for why it's 
doing so, all the things. Developed intelligence will all I'll let you know. Keep yeah. learning. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. Okay, sorry for my extreme awkwardness. Um, let me go back to where we were. Um, hopefully it does not come alive. But yeah, so I'm taking these these mass loss calculations that the ice sheet has, and I'm interpolating them onto the CESM grid, and I'm putting them in um, as a freshwater forcing, and then I'm seeing what happens to the climate response. And, and that was a one-way coupling. And so this is getting us some information about what happens with, with meltwater forcing simulations. It's absolutely wild. Okay, so what... So what you can do to stop the advancing um, is to go into transitions and there should be, um, yeah, there, like you want to um, on mouse click. Yeah. So hopefully that will fix that. I'm not sure why. Okay. Yeah, I don't know where the other thing could be coming from. I've never given this presentation before, so it's so weird. It's so weird. We will do our best to ignore it. <laughs> so sorry, you guys, um, for my absolute incredible awkwardness. But <laughs> it is really weird. I don't think that, like, there's no recording. No, it doesn't, because it says record up there. So there's not, oh, get rid of the asterisk. Un uncheck that. So you do it on each slide? Yeah. So well, you want to only do it on mouse click. So it's fine right now. Oh, yes. So okay. yeah. Um, and so go back into presentation and that should at least take care of it advancing on its own. It might have just been per slide. You might have to check per slide. So let's see. Hopefully that will work. Like, yeah. Okay. Let's see if maybe. Hi. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry. No, it's okay. It's um the computers are taking over. They really are. Does it want to run my simulations for me too? Uh, <laughs> that would really make me really yeah, um, It is doing the same thing each time, which is why it's looks my, like it was a recorded thing. Yeah. I took that one slide out of a previously recorded HQ presentation. Not oh, this one though. This one has never this one's brand new. I do not know. Well, very sorry. No, now it's going for it. Yeah, I think you have to do it first line. It should be kind of annoying. Right? It's crazy. Yeah. We're going to try to ignore it, I think. Yes, we will. We <laughs> definitely will. Yeah. Anyways, one of the things that came out of this first chapter of work is that the surface, uh, the surface temperature the rise in surface air temperature is delayed when you have Antarctic freshwater forcing. Um, and so that result really struck me as something that I wanted to dig more into. And it's these feedbacks between the ice sheet and the climate system that I'm really interested in. Um, and actually, Yue Dong um, made this incredible study, which you, if you haven't read it yet, just check it out, um, which was trying to constrain why this, um, this air temperature uh, response is delayed and showing that Antarctic meltwater has both local and remote changes. Um, and that Antarctic meltwater reduces the projected warming rates via both changes in ocean heat uptake efficiency and radiative feedbacks. And so it's this existence of these feedbacks that makes me think about what the implications are for policy. And so bringing us into the policy realm, we have the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was, um, established in 1992. And within it, there is in Article 2, the goal of stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. It obviously didn't play out because we have dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system right now. And so to try to operationalize this, because within the UNFCCC, there isn't actually a stated way to accomplish this, to accomplish the stabilization of greenhouse gases in a way that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference. So every year, the conference of the parties occurs, the conference of the parties that are, are, are signed on to the framework convention, um, and they come together in these annual negotiations to figure out how are we going to operationalize this thing that we've all agreed to. 
And so that process has been going on for now three decades. And um, one of the major things to come out of it is the Paris Agreement in 2015, which is has within it one part of the one part of it is to hold the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees Celsius and pursue efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial warming. And we're all very familiar with these two numbers because we hear them all the time. Um, and so that's sort of the way of operationalizing the Article 2 um, stated aims of preventing dangerous anthropogenic interference. And these, these goals of 2 degrees and 1.5 degrees Celsius, they're sort of connected in a way to mitigation through Article 4 of the Paris Agreement, which is talking about balancing um, emissions from sources and removal from sinks by the second half of the century. And so that's sort of like where some of these connection points come in. But I was thinking about this in terms of I'm running these experiments and I'm seeing this um, impact of freshwater forcing that we have a delayed atmospheric temperature rise. And I started to think about like this dichotomy between what's happening with the globally average temperature rise and what's happening with the sea level rise response because we have these dual impacts of Antarctic ice melt. And so here is a plot that I made, um, which is in red, is like the negative feedback on global mean surface temperature that came out of my freshwater forcing simulations that I ran with that one-way coupled methodology. And in blue is the um, sea level rise response when we take that delayed air temperature warming scenario and we feed that into the ice sheet model. This is the sea level response. You can see that in terms of the air temperature anomaly, we have like 2.5 degrees Celsius cooler in that freshwater forcing perturbation experiment than in a control simulation, which is more along the lines of the CMIP experiments, versus when we use that delayed air temperature rise to force the ice sheet model, the ice sheet model is still saying seven meters um, of sea level response in a, in a multi-century capacity. And this is uh, these are both under an RCP 8.5 scenario. So I was thinking about those dual impacts and I wanted to investigate that more. And that's what I did with um, the next chapter of my dissertation, which was just recently published this past fall in Earth's Future. And our guiding questions here were, how did the long-term global goal in the Paris Agreement, and there's the long-term global goal and the long-term temperature goal, and um, they're sort of interrelated, but how did that come to be based around a global mean surface temperature target? And then what are the climate justice implications of that, particularly when we consider sea level rise? And how do projections of Antarctic ice sheet melt interface with temperature targets and climate justice considerations. And so I worked really closely on this um, with Dr. Regine Specter, who's a political scientist who was on my dissertation committee, amazing person. Um, and it was our conversations about this over the years that really um, led this paper to take shape. And then also Dr. DeCanto um, and Dr. Natalia Gomez um, joined us to really think about this Antarctic ice sheet case study because the issues with the temperature target exist without even the Antarctic issues on top of it. And so um, these are my collaborators on this project. And so to think about where we are right now, global efforts are not on track for the Paris Agreement targets. You know, we are at 1.2 degrees Celsius warming today above the pre-industrial average. We are rapidly heading towards 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming and current policies and global action are putting us on a pathway to 2.7, maybe three degrees or so of temperature rise by the year 2100. So, you know, this, the Paris Agreement has been, um, you know, we've had a lot of time. It's been more than half a decade since that and emissions continue to rise. And so we we're thinking about some of these issues that are presented here. And so one, in terms of the long-term temperature goal, it's considered in reference to the year 2100 through that Article 4 connection. But sea level rise responses evolved over centuries. And so that you're not really encapsulating the impacts of all climate impacts by using a global mean surface temperature target, particularly when it's capped around the year 2100. And so the conversation about risk and climate risk tend to skew in policy circles around this globally average version of just one single environmental stressor. And then also when you think about dangerous anthropogenic interference, how do you find define what's dangerous? because danger is defined by the people experiencing it. And for different people, danger is going to look like some, it's going to look different to different people. And a target of well below two degrees Celsius, that's also pretty vague. And this whole 
situation tends to obscure the role of house gas emissions because of course when you have temperature you have to backtrack it so like emissions to co2 concentrations to how that's changing the temperature so for regulatory purposes it's much harder to control the source of the pollution when you have all these steps that you have to get to to like what your metric is that you're um, driving global climate action by and so we argue in the paper that it's really crucial to understand the origins of this target metric in the context of the broader inequalities that characterize um, global climate negotiations and so the disciplinary lens that I took to this work is that of physical geography. It's um, my, my disciplinary home um, <laughs> outside of climate science. Um, and so this is a relatively recent um, subdiscipline of geography. And it was put forth by Rebecca Lave. And it basically is stating that, you know, we can't rely on just physical science or just social science because the social biophysical system, these, these interactions between um, social systems and natural systems, they're very much a product of unequal power relations, histories of colonization, every bit as much as they are by like, you know, chemistry and, and physics and all of those things. So like what's happening in the world is really a social biophysical system. And then I was really inspired. Um, I had been thinking about all of these things and how they apply to my work. And then this other paper um, came out, um, which is by Emma Colvin and Marcus Thompson, looking at sort of bridging the divide between physical and social research and looking for avenues of collaboration in terms of climate modeling research specifically, and trying to make the case um, for interdisciplinary research collaborations so, um, so that research is more able to serve the goals of social and environmental justice work. And so I love that. And I became friends with both of them. I reached out. I was like, this paper. Um, and so that's that's sort of the disciplinary lens that we brought to the work to try to think about this, um, this temperature target um, climate justice situation. And so the methods and tools that are being used here are a vast literature review. I just the United Nations archives. Um, I looked at research that was published across um, history, law, politics, climate science, um, all sorts of different things. I read hundreds of papers. We could only cram like 220 citations or so into the paper, but I could have gone on probably forever. Um, and so that I really want people to like go, not just look at the paper, but like look at the citation list and like check out some of the amazing papers in there. And we also use sea level rise fingerprints to really get at the spatial variation of Antarctic source sea level rise. And then we looked at temperature and sea level uh, outputs from CESM and PSU 3D simulations in comparison to work from other teams. And this is to get at climate justice, we need to go to theories of justice. And so theories of justice have been um, evolving within the philosophical literature for decades now. And I use what's called the threefold theory of justice, which is a combination of procedural, distributive, and recognition justices and the interrelations between them. So distributive justice is like that unequal distribution of, of burdens and benefits. And it started out like the theoretical um, start of this was about unequal um, resource distributions. But in a geographic um, and climate sense, it can be about unequal, unequal distributions of climate impacts, especially relative to emissions. Um, and then recognition justice is thinking about differences in cultural and social groups seeking to address injustices and systemic disadvantages between them. And then procedural justice is talking about inclusion and political participation and how structural power impacts decision-making processes. And of course, all of these are interrelated because when you have unequal distributions of things, they're often from unequal recognition or like disparities of political power within different processes. And so justice theory as applied to sea level rise, I started thinking about in terms of distributive justice, the long-term and spatially variable impacts of sea level rise and how that's a multi-generational problem. And then procedural justice, thinking very much about the power dynamics within international negotiations. And then recognition justice about the recogni uh, recognizing the existence rights of cultural and social groups that are being heavily impacted by sea level rise and also um, impacts to future generations in terms of how near-term emissions impact them. And so the paper sort of centers on um, the Alliance of Small Island States for a variety of reasons, because we started to think about how the political negotiations led to the temperature target. We were like, well, who was also thinking about other things? Who was thinking about sea level? 
And AOSIS has consistently talked about sea level rise throughout their entire multi-decade history and, and ongoing into today. And this has been very central to the negotiating positions that they bring to the UNFCCC meetings. Um, and they have this very strong and ongoing history of advocacy. And so they formed in 1990 after the very first international conference on sea level rise, which was hosted by the Republic of the Maldives back in the 1980s, which is amazing. Um, this is just sort of the geographic layout of where AOSIS nations uh, are located. They're all over the world uh, in every in every sort of area. Don't become overwhelmed by this slide. Please forgive my figure making <laughs> capabilities. Um, I'm going to talk through conceptually what's going on here. <laughs> don't read it. Don't even try to read it. It's it's a figure in the paper for people to be able to refer to. Um, <laughs> so yeah, don't try to read it. I'm going to just give you the basic overview. Um, in we we tracked the historical development of this temperature target, and we tracked it alongside the scientific. Um, advances in terms of like what was known about sea level rise at what point in time. So hey, we were in this figure that's in the paper. It's a timeline in blue of scientific things that are happening. What did each IPCC report along that timeline say in terms of potential sea level rise and it's particularly potential sea level rise from Antarctica? In orange is anything that was related to a major UNFCCC happening and in purple was anything related to AOSIS. And so at the very start, back in the 1980s, there was um, a series of scientific workshops which were coming up with potential targets that could be used to drive international climate action. And at that point in time, different targets were being put forth, which were like rates or magnitudes of temperature rise, rate or magnitude of sea level rise, atmospheric CO2 con concentrations. And the hope was to have some combination of environmental stressors that could be um, tied to, to emissions and used for regulation of, of the source pollution that was driving climate impacts. And so it early, early on, what was being attempted was to have these sort of binding emissions reductions, where you would have, especially uh, nations of the global north, be required to, so like, for instance, in the Kyoto Protocol, be required to reduce emissions below by 5% below 1990 levels before the end of 2012. So if if emissions had actually gone 5% below 1990 levels by 2012, the mess that we are in today would not be as enormous of a mess. But this didn't work out for a variety of very interesting political reasons relating to advocacy of the fossil fuel industry, relating to what the United States was doing and what was happening politically, domestically, and, and a whole host of factors. But after Kyoto and the failure of Kyoto Protocol to really um, realize these binding emissions reductions, that was sort of the turning point away from trying to regulate based on binding emissions reductions and, and the shift towards um, a, a temperature-based metric. And so that is that that section of the paper is really just piecing together that timeline and what was happening in terms of political power, because the, the target, while it is informed by science, it's very much a political target that came out of a political negotiating process. And so it's like, sometimes it's referred to as a boundary object between science and policy. Um, and, but it is very much related to how there are, there are uneven um, systems of power that are operating on the international geopolitical scale. And so then in the next section of the paper, we're looking at recognition justice. And this began with habitability and migration. So we were looking through um, statements that were put out by the Alliance of Small Island States and how they are talking about sea level rise. And often they're talking about it as being an existential threat. And they're noting that they're already experiencing loss and damage today at the current levels of warming. And since there is scientific research showing that especially low-lying atoll nations are particularly susceptible to sea level rise, um, that, I, that there is a potential for permanent inundation of some locations. And that is a thing that's very much on the minds of, of AOSIS negotiators. And so um, partially that is because there's a very unclear legal status of what would happen the nation that lost their entire territory due to sea level rise. That's a very unfair question under international law. And so um, some of their statements say that like 
we're very concerned that in another 75 years, some of our members may no longer hold seats in the United Nations if the world continues on this present course. And so this is the way that it's coming up in these statements and in their negotiating precision, decisions. There's very much a preference for adaptation in place and for if emissions mitigation at such a level the adaptation in place would be possible. Um, and so like island studies literatures and social science literatures are very much stressing that like nuance and historical perspectives and a historical grounding are what's needed in conversations about sea level rise and habitability and migration. And of course, habitability isn't something that like you can run a model and say what land is going to be habitable at what point in time or not. Habitability is very much a question for the people living in a particular location. They decide um, when when they have to move or they get, you know, it's it's very much like needs to be decided by the residents. And so the hope is for mitigation action sufficient for adaptation in place. And the legacies of colonization um, run through this entire body of work. So almost all AOSIS nations were colonized and the majority gained independence for the last century. And also um, like islands are, you know, the, the land sea boundary is a very dynamic place. And so like groups of people that live in, in those sort of like boundary locations are very used to adapting to uh, environmental change. But the things that colonization brought reduced out of Adapt, adaptation capacities. And that was through, you know, resource extraction, colonial occupation, genocide, all of these things reduce modern adaptive capacity to sea level rise of other climate impacts. And um, so colonization, of course, was in part motivated by wealth extraction that fueled industrialization and that released fossil greenhouse gas emissions. And so thinking about all of these sorts of things, um, it's, it's very much relevant to how climate change is playing out today and how sea level rise responses are playing out today. And these are just a small sampling of some of the really amazing papers that talk about those sort of issues of colonization and climate impacts. There's also the issue of inclusion because colonization created gradients of wealth and power and that in turn um, creates systems of dependency and that influences negotiations and also the research processes and like who is in the room um, and how, how all of this is sort of playing out. And so a lot of things that came out of the literature review on this were a need for increased recognition and inclusion of local and indigenous perspectives in both policy discussions and in scientific research. Um, and one of the things we say is like these um, demographic analyses of, of IPCC authors even of sort of like what knowledge is making its way into like the highest level um, the highest level reports that are then informing policy discussions. And so there's still very much an unequal contribution of the um, of the global south or like an unequal inclusion of the global south um, in a lot of these spaces. And this is the newest version of that research that just came out a couple of days ago. Um, but recognition justice uh, in terms of sea level rise and especially across the generations uh, it's going to be determined by the, the temporal and spatial distribution of sea level rise, because what ends up happening in these particular locations is going to play out on that sort of distributive level. So looking at distributive justice, um, just as a starting point here, thinking about sea level rise commitment. So the UNFCCC came into play in 1992, and it's been decades since that point in time, and emissions have gone up throughout this whole point since the UNFCCC was created in 1992. And this is a look at the combined world emissions in red and a look at the combined emissions of all nations in the Alliance of Small Island States. That's that blue line at the bottom. So it's really nothing. Um, but globally, emissions have risen over that point in time. And along with those emissions that have happened during the UNFCCC process has been a commitment to further sea level rise that has become locked in as a result of those emissions. And so work by Noel's et al. Um, sort of uh, did a study trying to gauge what the additional sea level rise commitment was from emissions that have happened over the UNFCCC period and put that number at about 1.12 meters by 2100 or 0.25 meters by 2300. I believe that was with the magic sea level model. Um, and so, like I said earlier, near-term policy and emissions will dictate the long-term response of, of long-term sea level response, 
But even under a 1.5 Celsius warming, there is still a multimeter sea level commitment over millennia. Um, and so that that is a that is an issue going forward that there is going to be this long term sea level rise response even under relatively low levels of warming. And just to put this in a longer time scale, to sort of like characterize this figure within the the full scope of emissions, half of all historical CO two emissions have occurred since 1990. So since you know, from the Industrial Revolution to present day, half of all emissions have occurred since 1990. And so it's it's not trending in a good sort of way. Um, <laughs> the other thing that I want to talk about in terms of distributive justice is the idea of overshoot pathways. And so um, just a brief run over of what an overshoot pathway is. So when you have this 1.5 C warming um, threshold, there are two different ways to meet that. One is to never go above 1.5 Celsius. So that would be, you know, staying below that orange line there. But the other way is to overshoot it and then draw back down the temperature in some way through carbon dioxide removal or other um, technologies which have not been proven to work in scale yet and to get back down to 1.5 C by 2100. So those overshoot pathways have become normalized within policy discussions since around 2007. And so the, uh, the history of the development of overshoot pathways really paralleled the temperature target because as negotiations were going on about how to sort of like structure a target and like leading up to the Copenhagen Accords um, and, and then eventually the Paris Agreement, um, these, there, there was you know, calls for, for research to show, like, is this possible? What emissions pathways could, could make this achievable? And so this normalization of overshoot pathways, um, it tends to operate in the political realm in terms of justifying delays in mitigation, because you can say, well, we'll admit now and then we'll fix it later. Um, and so even though it's not proven to work at scale, and so this serves to justify the status quo fossil fuel-based emissions. And there's a paper uh, by Carton that came out in 2019 calling this the political economy of delay. And so overshoot pathways, they work to justify the temperature targets as being achievable while simultaneously legitimizing the lack of action that is likely to render them unachievable. And these are really a feature that came out of temperature targets. Because if you had a target based on some other indicator, say for instance, sea level rise, Overshoot is not going to work for that because you're not going to overshoot the sea level and then draw it back down without regrowing an ice. Sheet. And that's, you know, we're talking millennia for that. But so it works in terms of temperature, but it wouldn't necessarily work otherwise. So it's really a feature of having a temperature target. And this is some work uh, with uh, PSU 3D, the Antarctic ice sheet model, that was where we, we modeled if you're on a, a current present day scenario where you're trending towards three degrees Celsius of warming by 2100, what happens to the ice sheet if you start implementing carbon dioxide removal in 2030 or 2040 or 2050, does that help protect the ice sheet? And this is showing that on a multi-century timeline, it does not protect the ice sheet. There is still an interesting um, sea level rise contribution. So, and that's because once you, once you breach an instability point, say like Thwaites Glacier or something, you're not going to put that back together just by drawing down the atmospheric CO2 and then bringing down the temperature, most likely. Um, but the, we need more modeling to show, like, what temperature could that happen at? Is there a way that you could, you know, do that sort of thing and have some sort of protection in the long term? But so far, this this idea of, of overshoot, I don't think, works particularly well in, when you're thinking about sea level rise responses. And then looking at the spatial distribution of Antarctic sea level rise. So Antarctica is um, contributing to sea level rise in different ways, but through the, the GRD response or the gravitational, rotational, and earth deformational response, Antarctic sea level rise has an impact across the world. And this is um, related to, to gravity and to bedrock deformation and to changes in the Earth's axis as Antarctica starts to lose mass. And so as that change, like, because it's a dice it's giant mass. And so if something, if that mass is getting smaller, it's exerting a, a smaller gravitational pull on the ocean. Um, and so 
you end up seeing more of the um, the sea level rise response from Antarctic mass loss more in the far field than in the near field. And and the same thing with Greenland. You see the the Greenland sea level rise response is felt more farther away from the ice sheet because of that gravitational signal and also the rotational and deformational signals. So what we did here was we took the um, uh, an Antarctic simulation under RCP 4.5, so like roughly Paris Agreement aligned with no cliff collapse because it's still um, an uncertain thing within the literature. And, and I mapped um, the distribution of sea level rise um, from data that was generously provided by Dr. Natalia Gomez and her student Jeremy Rock. And so I used cartographic techniques um, from critical cartography to try to figure out the best way of representing um, island nations on a global map. And um, there was research showing that the best way to do that is to center the ocean basins using a good homology projection. So that's what I did here. And this is showing, um, so like in darker blue are those areas where you have the most like sea uh, level rise response from Antarctica, like where that's being felt the most. And that purple line that's running through the bottom there, that's where global mean um, sea level is in terms of the Antarctic contribution. And so we calculated spatial statistics at every uh, AOSIS location and saw that they were impacted by Antarctic source sea level rise um, at 12 to 33% higher than the global mean. And so given the emissions figure that I showed you earlier, that's a very disproportionate impact relative to their emissions contribution, which is essentially zero. Um, so that's what we were looking at in terms of that regard. And then getting back to this question of, um, of negative feedbacks. So the freshwater forcing projections by a variety of different teams tend to show approximately a negative feedback somewhere between 0.3 and one degree Celsius by 2100. And then um, at the time that I wrote this paper, there were very limited studies um, looking any farther term than that. And of course, like we need lots of different models to be able to characterize the overall response. Um, but these, and then you also have this issue of um, the induced climate impacts influence the ice sheet trajectory. So when you have a negative feedback on GMST from Antarctic freshwater forcing, that delayed air temperature rise can act to preserve the ice sheet for a little bit longer because it's not feeling as much warming if that's not driving as much melt. So we need coupled modeling to be able to constrain those feedbacks. And currently the carbon budgets, which are like how you say what, um, what amount of emissions would still keep us under a particular temperature. Um, the carbon budget calculations generally don't include feedbacks. There's like a push to try to get that included. And the, the remaining carbon budget under 1.5 C is so small that it's probably not gonna make too much of a difference to that. But if temperature targets were to be used as a metric post 2100, I think the policy difficulties are really going to increase because there's gonna be a lot of other feedbacks that are in that are coming into play. And it's that interaction between all of these different positive and negative feedbacks that is going to um, determine when a different, when a particular global mean temperature is gonna, is gonna be surpassed. And so to sum up this section, um, the justice analysis is really looking at how power dynamics influence the decision to adopt a temperature target because it came out of a, a negotiation process that's rooted in, in global geopolitics. Um, and then recognition justice is showing that like, we have this induced lo loss and damage. It's very much an ongoing concern, but also sea level, modern sea level impacts are also being influenced by historical oppressions and legacies of colonization. And that there's still not a full recognition um, within the physical sciences and within policy spaces of local and indigenous knowledges and perspectives. And um, then in terms of distributive justice, global mean temperature by 2100 is not avoiding dangerous anthropogenic interference, but particularly given the very long time commitment and uneven spatial um, impacts of sea level rise. And especially with this issue of overshoot pathways being a feature of temperature targets, those are all issues of distributive injustice. And then the Antarctic case study is showing that like sea level rise is coexisting with these negative feedbacks. Are there other sort of climate impacts that are like entangled within this sort of way, um, other sort of climate impacts that are entangled with global mean temperature in specific ways that impact specific groups of people? I'm very interested in hearing from like other research groups about thoughts about that, that sort of idea. Um, 
And so in the interest of time, because I had so many struggles at the beginning, I'm going to move on from the summary, but you can check it out in the paper. So constraining these feedbacks, constraining the feedbacks requires fully coupled dynamical models. And so from my early work with giving ice sheet model mass loss and freshwater forcing to CESM, I then came up with a way to have them be able to pass information back and forth. That way, if there's a delayed air temperature rise, then the ice sheet is going to, you know, melt slower at the surface. Or if there's increased subsurface warming, which is another thing we see in freshwater forcing experiments, then the ice sheet could melt from below faster. So like, which of these feedbacks is going to win out and how does, how do they, um, how do they impact the trajectory of both the climate and the ice sheet and sea level responses? And so now I have them running in an annual configuration where the ice sheet is giving data to CESM every year and CESM is giving data back to the ice sheet every year and they're stepping forward in time together. And so does it even work well? Um, <laughs> it, it, um, to check if it's working, I was matching it to observations, looking at the calving and basal melt rates around the ice sheet, looking at basal melt rates at specific locations, um, looking at the total change in mass, the total sea level rise contribution, and then the spatial changes in sea ice thickness. And I'm pleased to say that it actually worked pretty well. This is my simulated ice sheet in comparison to observations um, over on this side. And so I got it, I got it pretty good. Um, this is gonna show it for me. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's it's looking all right. Um, and then so once we felt good about how it was looking over the observational period, we ran it forward in this coupled configuration under RCP 8.5. And this is the this is the response. So this is the change ice thickness. You see, Kuwait's is not doing super well over there. Um, we have thinning in the large ice shelves, and we also have mass loss along the East Antarctic margin, and that's in large part driven by where the atmospheric temperatures are um, are warming and inducing hydrofracturing um, and calving along East Antarctic margins. So in terms of the sea level rise response, um, we have the East Antarctic contribution is negative in the near term, but then rapidly picks up and actually surpasses the West Antarctic contribution, which is very interesting and different from what many model results are showing. And that's, that is largely driven by that, that surface melting up in the East Antarctic margin. And then the West Antarctic ice sheet is always a little bit positive at the beginning in line with observations again, and is picking up over time. And then the total sea level rise contribution is about 0.27 meters by the end of 2100, which compares well to the AR6 range. And this is in comparison to our earlier simulations, when we ran just the ice sheet with the meltwater perturbed climatology that had that delayed surface air temperature rise, we found a lower sea level rise contribution than when you just run it with like non-freshwater forced climatologies. So the freshwater forced climatology did delay the ice sheet mass loss. And when we run it in the coupled configuration, it delays the mass loss even more. So this is actually acting to protect the ice sheet and it's because of that sensitivity um, of the, the, the ice sheet uh, to, to the atmospheric forcing because this ice sheet has um, both has a marine ice cliff instability, which makes um, surface temperatures really matter for the, uh, the ice cliff collapse response. So then when we're looking even longer term, out to 2200 in my simulations that are coupled, the east and west Antarctic ice sheet are actually contributing about equally to the sea level rise response, which is very different. This is a little disappointing. Yeah, okay, it's fine. There's a movie of how the ice sheet is uh, evolving over time there. And it, we ended up with about like, three meters of sea level rise by 2200. Um, and so that is how that is playing out. And then in terms of the temperature response, these negative feedbacks on air temperature, they're appearing by about mid-century, and then they strengthen after 2100. They're less intense compared to my one-way coupling simulations, but that's because the ice sheet forcing for the one-way coupled simulations was from the Decondro Collar 2016, which had a really massive um, ice loss. Uh, so this is, uh, yeah, so the, the the atmospheric feedback is less intense because the freshwater forcing is less intense. And so this is the air temperature anomaly and the blue line is the 30 year rolling mean. Um, and so, yeah, it's like pretty steadily trending towards an increasing uh, negative feedback. And just to think about this dichotomy between the temperature feedbacks and the sea level rise responses, by like the year 2100, we had like 0.28 C, uh, meters of sea level rise and, and around the same amount at, at the level of uh, air temperature anomaly of like 0.28 degrees Celsius. 
by 2150, you know, the sea level rise is really starting to step up. It's over a meter just from Antarctica. This is not including Greenland contribution or thermal expansion or any of those other sea level rise contributors. This is just the Antarctic um, response. And then where the, the GMST anomaly is strengthening over time. So you have this one degree Celsius anomaly by 2200 versus a three meter sea level rise response. But then the question becomes like, how does this feedback compare to the strength of other positive and negative feedbacks on global mean temperature? Um, and it really makes me think that global mean temperature targets would become more problematic post 2100 because of all of the different feedbacks and how do you characterize that and how you can translate that into policy or into regulatory action on emissions, it's going to become increasingly difficult thing. And so then just sort of looking ahead, um, we need to be able to better constrain climate feedbacks and improve projections via coupled modeling studies um, and just an increased understanding overall about how feedbacks are, are represented in climate models. Um, more collaboration across disciplines and across geographies, you know, we're a very interconnected world now. Um, we can we can have collaborations um, across the world. Um, increasing efforts to make policy and research more just and inclusive. So like DEI initiatives are absolutely critical, um, as probably everyone is aware. And then I want to also point out that on March 29th, um, the United Nations General Assembly will be voting on the uh, initiative that's being led by Vanuatu, but was initially put forth by uh, Pacific Island students finding climate change, a group of law students in the South Pacific who want to have uh, the International Court of Justice issue an advisory opinion on climate change and human rights. And that will help um, dictate sort of like what will be happening, um, especially in the climate litigation realm going forward. And that's very much related to like what I'm thinking about right now in terms of um, climate litigation to try to like push forward uh, emissions reductions and, and also protect and promote human rights. And so I think that's like a really crucial thing that we should all be thinking about. And, and it'll take a lot of research from both the physical and social sciences to be able to inform um, the conversations that are going to come out of, of whatever ends up happening with the, with the advisory opinion vote that's happening in the United Nations next week. And so uh, I think in large part, because it is an initiative led by Vanuatu and a lot of the AOSIS members um, are part of that, I think that this will, this will end up being a thing that's very relevant for feedbacks and for sea level rise. Um, and for thinking about how all of those things are playing out for in time. And I think I'm pretty much out of time, so I'm just going to stop there. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for your attention and your uh, your acceptance of my many technical difficulties. Um, thank you. Okay, so just give me a minute and I'll swap so we can see the questions cool. coming in online. Um, so Kevin, since you have your hand up, why don't you just unmute um, and ask your question while I bring up the chat? Okay. There it goes. Yeah. Hello. Uh, you know, you raised some very good points there and point out some of the difficulties with the global mean surface temperature as a metric especially with regard to sea level rise. I was surprised you didn't mention a bit more about the other component of sea level rise, which is the ocean heat content and the expansion of the ocean. You never really mentioned the oceans. And of course, uh, ocean currents are, are an important factor there. Uh, just on, on this whole question of the global mean temperature as a metric, um, you know, I wrote a book called The Changing Flow of Energy Through the Climate System, and it's really focused on a lot of aspects of energy, which is really what you're touching on here when you start talking about melting of, of Antarctic ice and, and so on. And it, it, it's, it, I think it's a really important distinction. And I think it's unfortunate as to what's happened in the Paris Agreement and in the IPCC that they've got such a big focus on global mean surface temperature, because I think a lot of it is actually quite wrong. Um, and, and well, let, let me illustrate it by, you know, what happens if you take a pot of water and put it on the stove? Let's say it's a gas stove, so the heat is either on or off, and, and you turn the heat on, well, the temperature goes up and, and it starts to, the water starts to bubble, and then it 
bubbles more frantically and it starts rollicking around. And as soon as you turn the heat off, it stops. And the, the temperature is the same, but the rollicking, which I would equate to extremes in the climate system, has turned off all of a sudden. And so I think a lot of what is confused is the temperature versus the rate of temperature change. And the rate of temperature change, of course, relates to the heating, which is what's really going on with the increases in greenhouse gases. And that's what's responsible for the melting. And, uh, and you know, I think a, a, it's, it's rather unfortunate that the, there's so much focus on this global mean temperature. But I wonder if you thought about these aspects at all and and in particular about uh energy and energy flows thank you so much for that question um yes i i actually i have thought quite a bit about like the ocean heat content um the reason i talk more about ice sheets than the ocean heat content is because we were using that as as our case study in the paper um the ice sheet response, but I've been, I was very much thinking about like, what would a second paper look like that was investigating this more from the ocean heat content perspective. Um, and I also have thought about the ocean heat content perspective in terms of multi-species climate justice, which is another one of the research areas I'm very interested in, um, because that ocean heat is of course having um, myriad biological impacts at all of the beings that live in the ocean. Um, so yeah, the, but the reason it wasn't included in the paper was because this paper spiraled to being an exceptionally long length and I had to rein it in at a point in time. And so it was just focused on the, the ice sheet case study. And in terms of the, the rate of temperature, yeah, that was, that was one of the early proposals that was put forward back in the late 80s and early 90s um, was to use the, the rate of temperature change. But because it, it sort of like fell out of favor because it was... Um, difficult to constrain the internal climate variability, um, the lake, and and so that was that was one of the reasons. But yeah, that that sort of metric uh, fell out of favor in favor of the magnitude of response rather than rate. But I agree with you that the rate is extremely important and the flows of energy. Okay, thank you, Kevin. So, do we have any in room questions? Yeah, Gunter. Um, as we're preparing for the next CIMIP uh, experiments, um, from your from your perspective, um, if you had to concentrate on a, on on a few scenarios that uh, compared to CIMIP six, are there some that you would you would prefer as opposed to others? Even in terms of emission scenarios, anything like so. So the CIMIP experiments like have a plethora of experiments. And you know, like, are, are all of them very useful when it comes to your perspective? In terms of all the different maps, yeah. So, like, is map or a map or for all of the different maps? Um, I mean, I know that there have been uh, other folks who do freshwater forcing studies who've called for like sort of like an intercomparison in that sort of sense to sort of constrain like what we're missing from climate model responses by not having dynamical ice sheets. So I think that that's a really interesting idea um, for, for a model inter comparison set of experiments that could happen, uh, trying to constrain ice sheet feedbacks um, in both Greenland and Antarctica. I think that would be really interesting. Um, that's probably the one that I've thought about the most, but I think anything that can help constrain feedbacks would be really, really helpful at this pro point in time. Um, I'd really like to see an intercomparison of like some some permafrost effects, and maybe that exists to some extent. It's outside of the literatures that I tend to read, um, but I'm very interested in that because it's very strong positive feedback, and so it would be like a counteracting to the to the negative feedbacks that I'm usually thinking about with Antarctic ice sheet responses. Um, but I think I think a feedback that's uh, sort of any any sort of model intercomparison that constrains feedbacks, I think, would be really helpful. Great, thank you. Any other in-person questions? So we do have one online. I put it up there. Um, so Rajas, please. Do you want to unmute and ask your questions? Or I guess it's pretty. 
Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, no, Amira, just, um, it's it's pretty simple. I, I wanted to hear you just talk openly a little bit about climate reparations and how realistic it was given the sort of uncertainties there are between cause and effect here. Meaning meaning that, you know, or actually maybe I will add a preface here. It's the, the, the ice sheet itself in some sense holds a, a lot of the mass balance and, and, you know, ends up affecting, um, has a downstream effect on on island nations, but how do you link that to to specific payers? You know, in a way that's meaningful. Meaning, like, or or is this something that an international body needs to take care of? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that does make sense. Thank you so much for that question. Um, so, in in terms of climate reparations, I feel like I personally could say as as an American woman, I don't think I probably have the, the, um, I think that the reparations, like what shape that takes would really need to be determined by the people that are experiencing the impacts themselves. Um, so I don't know that I could particularly say what climate reparations could look like, but I think that the having the discussion is extremely important. And I think that people who are being impacted by climate change should be able to put forth any sort of um, any sort of request for reparations and have that be absolutely taken seriously in the international realm. I think the thing that comes closest, and it's it's not reparations, that the folks who are negotiating around it are very clear that they don't want it classified as reparations, but the thing that would come closest are the current negotiations around the loss and damage fund. And so that really came out of COP27 where there was at the very last minute, and this was this was like one of the biggest fights that played out at COP27, was about establishing a fund for nations who are heavily hit by climate change to, to be able to have a pot of money available for when they are experiencing losses and damage due to climate-fueled events, like, like major tropical cyclones or something. And so that was, you know, at the very last minute of the conference that actually came together, which was one of the biggest wins to come out of COP27. And so that now the negotiations around that are turning to how to operationalize a fund for loss and damage. Like who is going to pay into it? Who's going to be able to take money out? You have to have an attribution study to show that the event that you experienced was fueled by climate change. And then how much money do you get as to address that loss and damage? And so that's going to be playing out over the next couple of years. And I think that'll be really important. One thing, like it is a major win in the negotiation space. But one thing that I always have reservations about is the fact that, you know, we have the adaptation fund, which has never been fully funded, despite it being, having been in place for 10 years now, it, that exactly. money has not materialized. And that's, that's, that worries me that maybe the money won't materialize for the loss and damage fund. Um, but I think it's it's particularly important for people who are being impacted, like the extensive flooding that Pakistan um, endured this past year. Like there sh there should be there should be money for that. There should be support and, and assistance provided, whatever they ask for, really. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really really important point um, to think about about who pays for the damage that's being caused. Okay, thank you. And we're already five minutes over, so I'm going to uh, put us off there. If that's all good. Okay, so thank you again. And um, yeah, Elizabeth, if you want to stop the recording, then you're welcome to exit out of.